Hello, my dear audience. This episode is about the most famous house in Los Angeles, the Stahl Residence. It's the ultimate Californian pool house. And with its minimalistic design, it's one of the most iconic homes in the world. Placed on a spectacular location and built with prefabricated industrial materials, it was constructed in a revolutionary way. This video shows how the house was made and it gives a complete walkthrough of the interior. But first, we gonna take a look at the history. The house was the dream project of Buck and Carlotta Stahl. This middle class couple always wanted to live in a luxurious pool house. But they lacked the funds and they had to be creative to make their wish come true. In 1954, they fell in love with a small hillside overlooking downtown LA. This building lot was available for rock bottom price because due to the many elevations, it was considered by many as unsuitable for building. Still they believed in their dream and they bought the location with a mortgage and no money to build the house. It took four years before the mortgage was paid off and until their financial obligations were met, they were not allowed to build anything. So it took a long period before they could even start building. The Stahl family used this time to make the otherwise impossible land suitable for construction. They eagleized a part of the ground. And with the retaining walls, they created a terrace-like structure to prevent landslides. In 1958 the mortgage was paid off and they had prepared the ground for building. They took a second mortgage to build the house, but still there was no design yet. Originally it was Buckstall's intention to design the house himself and he had already made a scale model and drawings that turned out to be not much different from the apparent result. However, Stahl was not experienced enough to design a complete house by himself. And he approached several architects who all turned the job down by saying that it was simply impossible to build a house for such a limited budget. Finally Stahl came in contact with Pierre Koenig, who saw the project as a challenge. He estimated that the construction costs would be about $34,000. That was way more than the mortgage of the Stahl family. Luckily he knew someone who could further finance the project. John Antenza, the editor of the Arts and Architecture magazine. This magazine had already sponsored the construction of a series of modernist houses, known as the Case Study Program. Antenza did the following proposal. The drawings of the house would be featured in the magazine, as well as many photos of the construction process. Once the house was finished, another series of photos would be published in a magazine. In return, Arts and Architecture would be funding the furnishing of the house. To reduce the required budget furthermore, equipment and material suppliers would sell at cost in exchange for advertising space in the magazine. The Stahl House became the 22nd design that was partly financed by the magazine, hence the name Case Study House 22. By sponsoring these houses, Entenza wanted to inspire other architects to build easily reproducible homes for the middle class, showing the world that luxury houses can be affordable for people with an average income and hopefully ending the severe shortage of middle class housing. This shortage was caused by the economic depression in the 1930s, followed up by World War II. During these periods hardly any new houses were built, while during the economic boom in the 1950s the demand for new homes exploded. Without the sponsorship the Stahl House could never have been funded. So it was important to cover the history of the case study program in this video. It was five years after the purchase of the building lot that the construction 
finally started. The first step in the construction process was to place concrete piles in the ground. On these piles, concrete grade beams were placed. Interesting is that one grade beam extended beyond the perimeter of the building ground. Therefore, a part of the foundation is visible from below the hillside. The extended foundation created the possibility of a house that partly cantilevered the hillside, making maximum use of the limited building space. On the foundation of grade beams, a series of 16 vertical steel columns were erected. These steel columns were aged beams, who were 4 inch thick, and they were standing on footings and connected to the grade beams. On top of these pillars, horizontal I-beams were placed. These I-beams were 12 inches thick. It needed only one day and five construction workers to build the entire skeleton, which was welded together. Once the frame was finished, a floor made of forced concrete was casted over the grade beams. This floor also contained an underfloor heating system that consisted of metal tubes. The roof was made by placing steel beams over the frame, which then supported metal plates. The great benefit of this construction is that the walls don't have to support the roof. This allows floor to ceiling windows that provide an unbroken view over the landscape. Still though, the house has one wall, located in the back at the north side, but this wall was only for privacy reasons, because it prevented people to look inside when passing by from the street. This wall was made by placing steel rib panels against the skeleton. Towards the west, east and south side, the entire construction was filled in with glass panels, and only at the carport the skeleton was left open, and no walls were placed at all. Finally, the concrete swimming pool was placed, and the house was finished. When you compare Buckstall's original design with Pierre Koenig's final result, you will see that the floor plans of both designs are not that different. The only major contribution that Pierre Koenig made to the design was creating space for a swimming pool, replacing the butterfly roof for a flat roof, and changing the curving shape of the bedroom wing into straight lines. Still though, Pierre Koenig deserves a lot of credit, because he developed the brilliant building process, in which the construction was minimalized to less than 60 different parts. Originally, Buckstall wanted the house to be built out of wood, but it was Koenig's idea to make the house solely out of prefabricated elements that were industrial made out of steel, glass and concrete. This allowed the house to be built extremely fast and economic. Pierre Koenig's progressive construction techniques influenced the prefabricated way most houses are built today, making the stall house an important milestone in the history of architecture. Because the design is so photogenic, the stall residence became the most famous of all the case study houses, especially the photos by Julius Schulman, who worked for the Arts and Architecture magazine, were republished in several other books and magazines making it an icon of modernism. The house became even more famous for its use in countless fashion photo shoots, and if that wasn't enough, it was also used as location for many movies and TV shows, including the first Columbo episode, Galaxy Quest, and even an episode of The Simpsons. It also inspired many artworks making it one of the most recognizable homes in the United States. At this moment, the house is still owned by the Stahl family, 
and on some days it is open for public and you can get a tour guidance. For those who are never be able to visit, I made this video. So let's take a look inside. We start our tour from the sky. From here we see the densely populated hillside and we see how confined the building lot actually is. Behind the house is a street that curves over the hill. From here you can still see the retaining walls that were once built by Buckstall. For the largest part the house is located above street level, but at the carport the street comes in line with the front door. Seen from the street the house feels enclosed and you can't see anything of the pool area. But once you get closer you can catch a glimpse of the pool through the wall of breeze blocks. We step through the glass front door and we are in the pool area. Let's now take a look at the floor plan. The house is placed on a building ground which is only 5000 square feet, 12000 feet if you count the slope of the lower hillside. The house itself measures 80 feet from west to east, 70 feet from north to south and 20 feet in the width. When you exclude the carport, the structure from left to right is only 60 feet long. This makes the interior space 2200 square feet. The swimming pool is 800 square feet, which is very large compared to the size of the house. When you color the separated parts, you see that the house has an open floor plan with a limited number of individual spaces. There are two directions that provide access to the living room. You can walk over the pathway in front of the sleeping area or you can walk over the terrace in front of the pool. From the entrance we turn to the left to the outdoor dining table that looks out over the valley. From here we turn to the left furthermore and we walk around the pool. By placing the house in an L shape every room looks out over the pool and through sliding doors you can enter the swimming area from every living space. This makes the pool the central part of the house, almost like an external living room. The house itself is not even that big and it is cheaply built, but the pool combined with a breathtaking view over the valley gives the house a feeling of graciousness and extreme luxury. This skill model shows how narrow the space between the pool and the valley is. The stall couple have three little children who all grew up next to the pool and the edge of a cliff and this demanded many safety precautions. So it might not be the safest family home. But by God, what an amazing view of the landscape. There is a porch that throws a lot of shadow over the terrace. This porch was made by extending the roof over the beams of the underlying frame at the south and west side, while at the north and east side the roof is almost in line with the skeleton. The porch also throws a shadow over the windows. Through one of the sliding doors we step inside. Because the house has a skeleton, internal walls are not necessary to support the roof, which makes it possible to create any preferable layout. The minimal use of interior walls ensures an optimal distribution of sunlight and you can see the landscape from anywhere in the house. Through a second sliding door you can step in the outdoor jacuzzi, while in the hot tub you can enjoy the Los Angeles skyline.
Well, in just a few seconds, you can leave the jacuzzi and take place in the sitting area. The windows are placed very close to the edge of the cliff, so from the interior you can see hardly anything of the underlying hillside. This creates the illusion that the house is floating high over the city. Behind the sliding doors is a small terrace. From here you can look down into the valley, which is 70 feet below. This spectacular living room is placed literally on the edge of a cliff. The horizontal beams extend a few inches beyond the roof, leading the perspective outside. This reveals the influence by Richard Neutra, one of the architects that inspired Pierre Koenig. At the east side is a narrow pathway that is used for window cleaning. Next to the pathway the property already ends and a neighboring lot starts, again illustrating that every inch of the available building space was used for the house. Luckily the neighboring residence is placed lower on a hill, so there's still some privacy. When you turn to the left you see the dangerous looking part of the house that is cantilevering over the hillside. Back inside we take a look at how the linear perspective and the many windows make the small living room look larger. This perspective is created by the lines of the many construction beams that are visible because there is no lowered ceiling. There was no money for a masonry fireplace and therefore a steel framed fireplace was made. Nowadays the steel frame is filled in with rock stones, but originally plaster boards were placed in the frame. The fireplace separates the living room into a sitting and dining area, thus functioning as a dividing wall while retaining the transparency of the large open space. Because it has openings on both sides, it can heat the sitting area and dining table at the same time. Most kitchens in the 1960s were enclosed, stucked away spaces, but this house has a kitchen that is fully open and placed central in the living space. While cooking you can look at the landscape in each direction. In front is a bar, in the middle is a cooking island and in the back is a kitchen unit placed against the only wall in the living room. The kitchen is illuminated by a light box that is placed in a lowered ceiling. The L-shaped house can be divided in three different parts. The sleeping area in the left has windows to the south, then the living room which has windows towards the south, west and east, and finally there's the part which holds the more private spaces, like toilets, bathrooms and dressing rooms. Very wisely, this part is located where you have the least amount of windows, the place where the two arms come together. Through this door, next to the kitchen, we step in a master bedroom. The wall in the back has a striped pattern of vertical mirrors, that again enlarges the amount of sunlight and the feeling of space. Yet the mirrors are narrow enough to maintain the private character of a bedroom. Because the internal walls don't have a load bearing function, they don't need to go all the way up to the ceiling, allowing space for a clear story, which again provides more sunlight and makes the room more spatial. Through this door you can enter the walk-in closet, which has closets on both sides covered by curtains. Behind it is the bathroom, which is the only space in the house that has half-height windows. We walk through the laundry unit and we return towards the master bedroom, but first we take a peek in the toilet 
which is accessible through a sliding door. Buckstall wanted the bedrooms to be as transparent and large as possible, so there was no place for a corridor. To reach the second bedroom, you have to walk through the master bedroom. This is not very practical, but again, aesthetics were chosen over comfort. All the three children of the Stahl family slept in this bedroom. By placing a small dividing wall, you can easily make two bedrooms out of this single space. This explains why the bathroom in the back has two entrances, each with their own individual washing tables. Both the first and second bedroom have sliding windows that can open towards a small concrete terrace. From there you can jump straight into the pool. Two concrete slabs are resting on both sides of the terrace. These slabs are the bridges of a pathway that connects the carport to the living room. Underneath the bridges the pool continues to the edge of the bedroom windows. The pool is located so close to the house that you can jump from the roof into the water. There are two reasons for the close placing of the pool. First, sunlight is reflected from the water inside the house. And second, the temperature of the water creates natural cooling, which is very welcome on hot days. This was cheaper than air conditioning, which was very expensive in the 1960s. We walk over the bridge and we are back at the front door, the place where the tour started. When you compare number 22 with the other case study houses, you will notice strong similarities between all the designs. This similarity is the result of John Antensa's own taste in architecture. Namely, Antensa preferred minimalistic and transparent houses with straight lines. Based on this preference, the sponsorships were granted. Therefore, the case study houses form an architectural movement with their own trademarks. This also explains why organic architects like John Lautner and Frank Lloyd Wright were never approached by Intensa. They simply didn't fit with his taste in architecture. Still though, John Lautner designed a few houses that have some similarities with the case study movement. Whether you prefer the organic style by Lautner or the minimalist style of the case study movement is up to you. I like both styles, but Lautner always remains my favorite. We end this video with a look over the nightly skyline of Los Angeles. This was your tour guidance. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.